And it came to pass in those days that <clears throat> there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made with Cyrenus, was the governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, and everyone in his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, and unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he is, was of the house of the lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, that the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. And she <clears throat> brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room in the inn. No room for them in the inn. Father, as we come to you this morning, we think of your precious son this morning, how much he means to us. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would take the scriptures this morning, and not only that we would hear, but also that we would do accordingly. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of the message this morning is Behold the Lamb Provided. We have preached, Behold the Lamb of God Promised, the Lamb of God Prepared. We have been watching as God's plan to send His Lamb into the world uh, has been un is beginning to unfold now. Remember, when man fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, God made a promise that a Redeemer would come through the seed of a woman. Amen. And that promise now is going to be fulfilled. <clears throat> the seed of a woman, Christ the Savior of the world. Amen. Now, God worked to bring this event to pass. Our text tells us about the night that God's promise was fulfilled in, in, in this text. So let us look this morning, Behold the Lamb Provided. First thing I want you to notice, the place involved in the Lamb's provision. The place involved in the Lamb's provision, which I read the first seven verses. I want you to notice under this, the planning of that place. The planning of that place, you'll notice in verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David. So we see the plan and the place here. The fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem was no accident. It's not coincidence. It was the plan of God. God makes no mistakes. Amen? Amen. Praise God for that. We make mistakes, but God doesn't. It was predicted years before it came to pass. This was common knowledge among those who studied the scriptures and knew the Old Testament. We know Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says, Behold thou Bethlehem, a child shall be born. We know that for a fact in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, John chapter 7, verses 7 through 42, all talk about a child that's going to be born in the place called Bethlehem. And so it was a place that was already planned in the mind of God, and nobody was going to change it. Keep that in mind. Nobody's going to change it. Okay? I want you to notice that God got involved with this. Notice the providence of this place in verses 1 through 6. The events surrounding his arrival, it was amazing. Verse 4 tells us Mary and Joseph live where? In Nazareth. 70 miles away, north of Bethlehem. That's where they lived. For the Messiah to be born in the right location, something had to happen. A series of events worked together to bring it to pass. Remember, a pagan emperor, Caesar Augustus, living thousands of miles away, issues a decree that everybody is going to register, be registered and pay a tax. Amen? Yep. See, sounds like America, doesn't it? <laughs> Man. What I like about this this was all in the plan of God. All right? You see, Joseph here 
has to take Mary and return to their ancestral family's place, their lineage, Bethlehem. Caesar may, what I like about this, Caesar may have been ruling, but God was over ruling. Amen. Amen. Amen? That's the great miracle. Never forget, believer, this morning, you might have plans, you might have things you think needs to be done in our way, but God can overrule anytime he wants. Amen? That's what I love about God. You know? This is what we think we got it down. God says, no, I'm going to overrule that. Just like he did here. Caesar thought he had it in control, but guess what? He overruled Caesar. I love that. Look at Psalm 121 for a second. Psalm 121. And I want you to notice verses 1 through 8. Great Psalm. The Bible says, Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my what? Help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not what? Slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from henceforth, at this time forth, and even for what? This psalm tells us God's providence. He rules over everything. Amen. Amen. Always remember that. Because mankind has a tendency to say, I'm going to do it my way, rule it my way, and you leave God out of it. Caesar didn't get his way. So always remember that. You see, it's, it's all about him. And his providence and his dealings in our lives. Amen? Remember, we're not our own. We've been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we don't own each other. I'm glad for that. <laughs> Notice, this was all in God's providence. That's what I love about a church body. It's really not my body. That's God's. Yes. You realize that this morning? Mm -hmm. This local church belongs to God. Amen. It doesn't belong to me. Right. doesn't belong to you. Right. You don't own it. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? God's the one who controls everything. Right. How many times have you heard me say, that's why we don't make a move unless the Holy Spirit moves. Okay, he's got to tell us what to do and how to do it. Because sometimes we have a tendency to think, this is mine, and it's going to go my way. It doesn't happen like that. The guy says, no, this is, he's going to be born in Bethlehem, and God says, I'm going to overrule this because I'm in control here, amen? Isn't there a beauty in that? When we surrender to God, Amen. He's in full control, isn't He? Amen. That's the greatest place to be. Amen. That's right. <laughs> so you see the plan, you see the providence, but notice verse 7 very end. Notice the poverty of this place. What do I mean by the poverty? Our Lord's entrance to earth was not glorious. Do you ever notice that? It was not glorious at all. There was no Pompeii, there was no lightning, there was no, it was just blah. And it was poverty. You see, the Bible tells us that he was born, he, he was not born into luxury, though he created all things and he owns all things. Wow. Look at Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, great passage of Scripture. 
We all need to live it and practice it. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Well, let's read, let's get, let's start chapter 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded in heaven, the same love, being of one accord, one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man to his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now Christ set the example of that. Watch verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. What's the next two words? No reputation. In other words, he didn't show himself off. Right. He didn't say, I'm Christ, this is the way it's going to be. No. He humbled himself. Yes. Wow, that blows my mind. No reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant mm -hmm. and was made in the likeness of men. Being found fashioned as a man, he what? Humbled. Himself. That blows my mind. The very God of the universe humbling himself to mankind. We all need to learn that. Humble himself, and, be, and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God also highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in the earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. You talk about, Amen. remember, he left heaven's yeah. glory and came into poverty. He wasn't born in a millionaire's house or a millionaire's family. He was born, to, born into a family that was poor. You ever thought about that? Yep. Now, he's God on earth. He could have said they, they would have lived in poverty all their lives, but no, he chose to live that way. Wow. Jesus was born to die for the sins of mankind. He knew his purpose. Notice the picture of this place in verse 7 also. Mary was told her baby would be wrapped in what? Swaddling clothes. You all know what that is, right? Swaddling clothes was the material that was used to wrap dead bodies. Dead bodies. And prepare them for their what? Burial. Jesus was wrapped in those. Hmm. The significance here is that he was born to die. From the time of his birth, he knew that one day he would go to Calvary. And suffer all that agony for my sin and for yours. Thank you. Very picture, right from the very picture, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Mary got it. She knew. Remember, the Bible says Mary kept all these things in her heart. She knew the whole plan. Wow. That must have been hard to give him up. Can you imagine that? I can't. Raising him, knowing that one day she would have to surrender him to Calvary. Knowing that he could say no. Maybe she was thinking, oh, maybe he'll change his mind. She was human. Who knows what's going through her mind when all of a sudden they took Jesus away and she knew that next time she would see him, he'd be dead. And watch, or excuse me, watching him die, that's what the next thing she saw. Wrapped in swallowing clothes. 
Notice also, Mary put Jesus in a manger. A manger was a dirty, filthy feeding trough for animals. That's, that's what it is. When you walk into a stable, the, the feeding troughs, they just put, slap the food in there and, you know, animals ate. It was dirty and filthy. I'm sure she cleaned it when she saw it. I'm sure she did, like any mother would. But this is the point I want to make. This feeding trough was no accident. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Did you know that it was a feeding trough? Did you know in John 6, 35, Jesus was called the bread of life? No accident. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. Get the picture? I love God's plan. Everything's there if man would just seek and look at it. Bread of life, house of bread. What is, you know, come to Jesus this morning if you don't know him. He will satisfy your hungry soul this morning. You run to Jesus and come to Jesus, you'll never be hungry. You'll never be thirsty. He is the water of life, too. In other words, he'll take care of you. Wow. Notice verse 7, too. Notice the promise of this place. Notice the promise. I am thankful that Jesus was born in a manger and not in a palace. I'm glad he was born to a humble surrounding and not wealth. You say, Pastor, why? I'll tell you why. If he, had been, if he would have been born into wealth and in the palace, the shepherds would not have any access to him. That's why. You know, people today think money can solve all problems. It doesn't. It creates more, yeah. You see... But because he was born in poverty and in humble surroundings, he was made approachable to any person that wanted to come to him. You see what I'm saying this morning? If he were born in a palace, guards, locked doors, no access to Jesus whatsoever. No, he chose to be humble so that everybody who saw him will come to him and the Bible says, in no, in no wise he'll cast you out. I am so thankful that he was not born into wealth. Amen. So that's the place. Notice the people involved in the land's provision. This is interesting. Notice the people in verses 15 through 19 in our text. 15 through 19. And it came to pass that the angels were gone away, them into heaven, and the shepherds, and one and another let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. Then they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told of them concerning this child. And all that they heard it wondered at the, those things which were told of them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Notice the people here. Number one, notice shepherds in verse 8. Of course, shepherds, their occupation, they what? Took care of sheep. They washed the sheep. Shepherds, if you study the lives of shepherds, it was dirty work. It was hard work. And what you don't see, you see in films and stuff, shepherds were gone from their home for long periods of time. Sometimes months, sometimes even years, they'd be gone. They, they were crude, vile men known for their life, wasteful, sinful lifestyles. These were crude men. Kind of like that old song, remember when Big John comes into town? You know, look out. Well, when shepherds hit the town, 
The townspeople were glad when they left. <laughs> Because all they did was raise cane, throw parties, and get drunk, and, and, and that was their lifestyle. Shepherds were, according to Jewish culture, shepherds were ceremonially unclean and considered the lowest of low people. Yet, don't you find it interesting? It was these men that heard the glad tidings first. Amen. Yeah. What a blessing. Men may not care about you this morning. People may look down on you in disgust because of who you are, but God loves you in spite of you. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Should, not, should that not be mm -hmm. towards us as well, each other? We love each other despite each other. Amen. Now that's a work of God, amen? amen. <laughs> that sure is, you know? So, notice the people. Rude, crude, dirty, living like their sinful ways. But notice verse 15 and 16. These men, they come, they hear the news, they run to Bethlehem to find Jesus. Do you notice that? They come. Mm -hmm. Which tells me this morning, are you running to Jesus this morning? Mm -hmm. Are you coming to Jesus this morning? As you are? They were running to Jesus to find grace and redemption. Are you running to Jesus to find salvation this morning? If you are, he will not turn you away. Praise God for that. Amen. Look at John 6. In John chapter 6, notice verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Wow, isn't that nice? Look at Ephesians 1 6. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us what? Accepted in the beloved. Aren't you glad when you came to Jesus? All of you were accepted by Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why we accept each other. Amen. Aren't you glad that when you came to Christ, you, you, he didn't say, well, you better change your act first. You better do this, that, this before I accept you. No, he says, I love you as you are. And if you ask me into your life and heart, I'll accept you as you are. Isn't that great? What's nice about that? He still does that. Not salvation. Once you're saved, you're always saved. But you know what? No matter how we act, no matter what we do, his arms are always there saying, I love you. I know some of the things I've done as a Christian, I'm so glad he loves me. By the way, aren't you glad he knows you? Yes. Sometimes I say, Lord, you know how I am. I'm glad you do. He says, yeah, I know. <laughs> and I'm going to take care of it, too. Now, sometimes I'll say, no, I don't want you to. But that's okay. What I love about these shepherds, they heard and they obeyed. Notice their obligation here in verses 17 through 19. Notice their obligation. What they experienced would be shared by them. They didn't hold it in. They heard it, they believed it, and they ran off and what? Spread it. I like that. They spread the good news. They told everyone, when a person receives Christ into their heart, you cannot keep quiet. Amen? Amen? Amen. you got to get it out somehow. Right. 
Even if it's joy, even if it's a smile, even, you know what? I got saved. You got to get it out. No such thing as a silent Christian. Go tell it on the mountain. Hey, amen. Go tell it on the mountain. You got to get it out, people. Amen. And they did. They, got it. They, they didn't keep it quiet. Mark 16, 15, you don't have to turn there, it tells you that. And isn't that what Acts 1, 8 is all about? Look at Acts 1, 8. In Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, but ye, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be quiet. <laughs> is that what it says? No. You shall keep silent. No. no. I'm just going to keep it in. No. You shall be what? Witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the other parts of the earth. In other words, we're always talking about Jesus. Amen. No matter where we live or where we are. Isn't that neat? Yeah. We can't help it. So the next time you're witnessing, people say, all you do is talk about your Jesus. You say, yep. yep. Can't keep quiet about it. Amen. That's what Christmas is all about. Yeah. Spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what it's all about. So the people are involved. Filthy shepherds. They got saved. They left spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. Then lastly, notice the praise involved in the Lamb's provision. Notice verse 9. There was a heavenly what? Praise. Did you catch that in verse 9? Suddenly the angel of the Lord appears above the shepherds. There is brightness like a flash. That lights up the sky, and the shepherds are terrified. I would be too. You remember, it's dark. And I don't know what kind of light this is. Well, I'm assuming, as I study the scriptures, that when that angel came, it came with a, with a glory-type light. That, that was probably the... When that, thing, when that light came on, it might have been like blindness, almost. It was like when, I, when we were driving into church this morning, we got on Route 8, you know, snow, and, uh, uh, and uh, melted, and that glare. I had to lo look off to the side because it, my eyes, I couldn't see. I, I bet you it was like that. Yeah. They look up and they go, what's this? And they're terrified. They've never seen anything like this. Remember, the glory of the Lord always came into the temple. And everyone outside the temple. It was in the Holy of Holies. All of a sudden, bam! Wow! So they appeared. And notice verse 10 through 12, the announcement. The angel tells them that the hope of the ages has been provided. That's why he titled the message this morning, The Lamb Provided. The Savior has been born. The seed of a woman has, uh, that God promised has come. It's been fulfilled. Genesis 3.15 is fulfilled now. What an announcement. Christ will deliver men from the curse of sin. Like the song, I've been delivered. Yeah. But notice it. The, the angel said, to the shepherds, unto you, got personal. Did you catch that? It got personal. Unto you, shepherds, what are you going to do with this message? Wow. It was made personal. They needed a Savior also. They really did. And praise God, they did. Notice the anthem here in verses 13 and 14. The angel is joined by a great multitude of... Man, bad enough, one. Now a whole host of multitude of angels are coming. I bet you those shepherds thought, we're dead meat. We are dead. Angels? They've never seen angels before. 
angels rarely, rarely appear in Scripture. When they do, you know, remember I said, if they come, it's either two things, either blessing or judgment, one of the two. So when the angels come, you know something's going to happen. The angels joins with a great multitude praising God and declaring the truth that the message is for all men. I love that. And notice what happened. See, there was a heavenly praise, but also there was a human praise in verse 20. Did you catch that? In our text in verse 20. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all things that they had heard and seen. It was told unto them. See, they were praising God mm -hmm. as humans. Mm -hmm. When they heard the message, no doubt those shepherds were amazed. But they found Jesus and were convinced of the message. The truth of the gospel was brought forth. My question to you this morning, do you know the truth? I hope you do. That's what the Christmas holiday is all about. If you've missed the truth, then what you've done, you've just been a pagan celebrating a pagan thing. That's all you've done. You've missed the whole truth that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem to die for your sin. Praise God he did that. Amen. They were convinced. Jesus said he's the truth. Amen. Amen. Notice the praise of a changed heart. Think about this. It must have been something to watch a group of raw, boned, rough shepherds leave town doing what? Praising, God. Praising and rejoicing in God. But, 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 can you imagine that? Yeah. Normally they leave a town drunk, upset, you know, having carousing around, say, you, you know. Wow. You see, the last time they came to Bethlehem, Jesus wasn't born. Remember that. They came into town to do some carousing, and all of a sudden, uh oh. Something's changed here. That's right. You see, the last time they came to the rooster, they had been cursing. They'd been acting like what sinners do the best. Sin. Now, they are new men. They, they cannot help themselves but to praise God. And isn't that what 2 Corinthians 5.17 is all about? Behold, if it may be in Christ, he's what? A new creature. All things pass away. Behold, all things become what? New. I got to thinking for a second. I said, I wonder what the townspeople were thinking. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're getting ready. Oh, no, here they come. Yeah. And now they're saying... What's happened to these now? Yeah. They're talking about God. They're praising God. They're, their lives look changed. They say, What's going on here? That's usually what happens when you get saved, right? Your family, your friend go, what's, What happened to her? What happened to her? What happened to him? I don't get it. Well, what happened? Jesus entered my life. That's what happened. I got a whole new life. I got a whole new meaning. I got a whole new way of thinking. I forget the name of the song, but the context of the song is uh, it was a little boy and his father was an alcoholic, a drunk, and he always came home and beat up the wife and, and the son. That was the pattern he lived. And next time he went out, they were, they were getting prepared to get beat again. Thanks to, Calvary. Thanks to Calvary. Yeah, that's the song. Thanks to Calvary. You know, they knew he was coming home. He opens up the door. The boy runs in the closet like the normal. And the dad says, you've got a new daddy now. Amen. Thanks to Calvary. Amen. You've got a new daddy now. He got saved. 
Wow. Salvation is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Behold all things come here. <clears throat> yep. My question to you this morning, do you have a personal relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? If you don't, please come to him. Amen. And if you are saved this morning, let Jesus rule you. Yep. Let's all humbly bow before him and let him rule our lives and change our ways. Amen. Amen. Surrendering to Jesus is what it's all about. That's right. Amen. Even Jesus had to surrender to the cross. Right. You think he wanted to go humanly? As the, as the hum no, that's what the garden's all about. Lord, if it's all possible, take this thing away. I don't want to do it. But he says, what? Let thy will be done. That's right. Now that's a phrase we all should live by. Amen. Lord, let thy will be done. Not mine. Amen. Thine. Amen. And when you do that, what a wonderful, powerful Christian walk we have. Amen. Amen. Isn't it? It's a wonderful life. Though I don't like that movie, but... <laughs> <laughs> I do like the movie. I, I just get tired of people watching it over and over and over. <laughs> but it is a wonderful life, amen? You know why we have wonderful lives? Because he was born in a manger. Amen. And he grew up to be the God-man. Surrendered to the cross. Bled and died for our sins. Rose again. Amen. The third day. That's what this is all about, really. That's right. The birth should bring us to the resurrection and the second coming. Amen. He's coming back again. That's right. You believe that? Yes. I do. Be surprised a lot of churches don't. But I do. When's he coming? I don't know. But I know one thing. I'm prepared and ready. I can't wait. Anytime. The older I get, the better I think, even so come Lord Jesus. And I'm not that old. You know? But, yep. So let's walk out of here this morning praising the Lord, realizing that we are people who are just like the shepherds, lived on godly, sinful lives, and yet God saved them and spoke to them. Aren't you glad that one day Jesus spoke to you and changed your whole life? And let's remember, God planned it all. He planned the whole thing. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the plan. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can truly worship you because you live in our hearts. And as we give the invitation, I pray, Father, that there's one here that's not saved. May they come to Jesus, the bread of life, the living water, the way, the truth, the life. He's everything. Yes. May they come and give their lives to him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.